All right, we'll now take up our study on marriage, divorce, and remarriage with the study of the Lord Jesus' answer to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19. We want to begin reading with verse number 3. The Bible said, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, first thing, we need to get this um, uh, statement down or the question down. And the first thing we'll notice about this question is it wasn't a sincere question at all to begin with. The Bible said they came tempting him. They weren't interested in truth. Uh, they weren't really wanting to learn doctrine. They were trying to trick him as they did many times and trying to trap him and trying to get him to contradict something that Moses had said in order that they could discredit his teaching and ministry and that they weren't interested in the truth at all. The Bible said that they came unto him tempting him and they weren't even a sincere group of students as they came to the great teacher and asked him. But nevertheless, they come with this question, is it lawful, is it right, is it okay uh, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Notice that there was no question about uh, a, a divorce or remarriage yet. They just said, uh, for what cause can we do it, Jesus? Is it lawful? Can a man just up and put away his wife for any reason he wants to? Make sure you get the, the, the uh, content of this question. The content is this. Can a man just divorce his wife for any reason he wants? And, of course, divorce, as we've seen already in the Old Testament, and we'll see throughout the New Testament, always includes the implication of remarriage of the, of the divorcee. So the Lord uh, is asked this question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause what they wanted to know here was the cause you'll notice that little those two little words every cause is not mentioned in mark chapter 10 the question was different of course you see a different answer he gives the cause here in matthew 19 he does not give the cause in mark chapter 10 but nevertheless let's go on with the answer of the lord jesus in verse 4 and he answered and said unto them have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now here the Lord Jesus reverts back to the original plan of marriage. Adam and Eve, God's perfect plan of marriage uh, there in the Garden of Eden. Now keep in mind that there's no adultery involved in these verses at all. This is God's original plan and this still is the Lord's will for every man and every woman for a man to pray and to seek the will of God for him to find a, a Christian young woman, fall in love, get married, become one flesh with her, and no more be two flesh but one, and what God joined together let not man put asunder, and they should stay together as husband and wife until death. That is God's original plan, and that's what the Lord refers to, verses 5, 6, or 4, 5, and 6. But notice verse 7. They say unto him, Why, the, why did Moses then command to give her a writing of divorcement and to put her away. And of course, we just got through studying on side one of this tape uh, what they're referring to here. This is Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1 where Moses did say give her a writing of divorcement and to put her away and she could go and be another man's wife. And the, they asked the Lord, why did Moses uh, command to do that if God doesn't want any man to put away his wife. And then the Lord answers, of course, in verse 8, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. And you know the reason why they put away their wives in the Old Testament, for some uncleanness. And we showed you what some uncleanness is. They ask him, can a man just put away his wife for every cause? And the Lord answered them, and he said, 
Well, Moses allowed you to do that, but the only reason he allowed you to do that was because of the hardness of your heart, but from the beginning it was not so. Notice, what he has said so far is this. If I understand this scripture correctly so far, the Pharisees have came to Jesus and they've said, Can a man just up and divorce his wife for any reason? And the Lord says, No. And they say, Well, why did Moses allow it? And Jesus said, Because of the hardness of your heart. That's why. And I say unto you, See, verse 9, Here he makes his authoritative New Testament statement on divorce, on the cause of divorce, the grounds for divorce, and the permission of remarriage in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Here the Lord drops the bomb here, and he says this. And keep in mind now, this is about a man divorcing his wife and marrying another woman. We still haven't got to the question of what happens if your mate divorces you and you ain't got nothing to do with it. We'll get to that when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But notice here what he's dealing with is what grounds does a man have to put away his wife and marry another woman? And he said this, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. The answer is very simple. They said, Lord, can a man put away his wife for any reason he wants to and, and marry somebody else? And the Lord said, no, he can't. And they said, well, why did Moses allow it? And the Lord said, because of the hardness of your heart. And I say unto you, if a man divorces his wife and marries another woman, he commits adultery, unless that divorce was because of fornication. Now, anyone that will look at that scripture honest and unbiased and unprejudiced will have to admit that's the content of these passages of scripture. Now, notice the Pharisees' question here. It's, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife forever cause? And the Lord said, now, it wasn't that way from the beginning. And then they asked him, why did Moses allow it? And he told them for the hardness of their heart and then gives his statement on why a man could put away his wife and marry another. Notice that remarriage is very, very clear in verse number 9. There is no such thing in this scripture that a man can divorce his wife because she commits sin but then has to stay single the rest of his life. There is no such thing in this scripture. The entire scripture hinges on that word except it be for fornication. Now, the non-dissolution teachers the teachers who would teach the opposite of what you're hearing on these tapes say everything in the world from except it be from fornication is not an inspired text to the uh, premarital Jewish betrothal period and that Jesus was talking to Jews only. But it sure is, it sure gets funny when you hear them say that Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32 where Jesus said this, same thing, if a man puts away his wife and marries another, except it be for fornication, it's adultery. And they'll say, no, that's just to Jews only. That has absolutely nothing to do with Gentiles at all. They're in Matthew 5.32. But you watch the same guys jerk out verse 28 and preach it to a Gentile congregation. Look at Matthew 5.28 and see what he says. It said, if a man looks on a woman and lusts after her, he commits adultery in his heart. You reckon that was just to Jews also, how come verse 32 is? It verse 28 is in Matthew chapter 5. Now, I'm just giving you some thoughts now. I'm thinking about these things, and I'm going to prove now in the next few minutes by the Scripture and by uh, documented evidence that the term except it be for fornication is exactly what Jesus meant to say. He did not mean a Jewish maid engaged to a husband he did not mean premarital sex of a Jewish woman or his, a man finding out his wife wasn't a virgin on their wedding night. He meant fornication. And so at this point, we're going to have to take a little while and study the meaning of fornication. Before we do, make sure you get the context, t content of Jesus' statement. He said, if a man divorces his wife, and marries another woman, 
he's committing adultery unless it's for fornication. And of course, the implication is if a man divorces his wife for fornication and marries another, he is no adulterer. He, she is no adulteress. Though he be married to another woman, she be married to another man. Now, it's kind of like at a youth camp I was preaching at one time. They, they said no printed T-shirts at this camp. And the rule was circulated around the camp. They said no printed T-shirts. That's Mark and Luke. No printed T-shirts. Um, but then somebody come up and said, well, I've got one that said Jesus saves on it. And they said, well, of course you can wear that. And they said, kids, what we meant was no printed T-shirts except those with gospel messages on them. Now, these, those two statements didn't contradict each, contradict each other. It was very clear that when the statement was made, no printed T-shirts, that it excluded gospel T-shirts. They didn't want rock and roll or movie stars or, uh, you know, wicked pictures or anything like that on their T-shirts. So they just said, all right, kids, you can't wear any printed T-shirts uh, to these to this youth camp, except Christian t-shirts. And if a man walked up to a, one of the leaders on the campsite and he said, is it all right if we wear printed t-shirts? And he said, no, that would be like the Pharisees asking Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and the statement made by Jesus in Luke chapter 16. But here in Matthew, he gives the exception. And where Jesus gives the exception, you and I must give the same exception. You can't be more righteous than the Lord, friend. And if the Lord made an exception, then me and you better be real careful before we start contradicting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here at this point, we again run head on into the premarital fornication teaching of many uh, teachers and preachers where they make a lot of dogmatic statements about fornication being premarital sex only. So at this point, we're going to have to take a little while and do a deep, in-depth study, to quote the modern term, of the word fornication. Now, we'll start by saying this. Fornication and adultery are often synonymous in the Bible and interchangeable. Now, make sure you get this statement. We are not necessarily interested in a modern-day meaning of a word if it contradicts the Bible meaning of that word. In other words, if the Bible gives a word a certain meaning, we are going to stick to what the Bible says about that word. And we're going to now offer you scriptures that prove that fornication in the Bible, and we'll give you some out of the Bible in a few minutes, but right now, fornication in the Bible is synonymous with adultery, with incest, with homosexuality, it is a sin that can be committed before marriage. It is a sin that can be committed after marriage. It is a sin that can be committed just men and homosexualities with beasts. Is fornication in the Bible is any illicit sexual activity. We'll start out with Acts chapter 15 and verse number 29. In Acts chapter 15 and verse number 29, in your King James Bible, the book tells us that the new converts there, when they wrote to them, they commanded the new converts in Acts chapter 15 and verse number 29 to abstain from certain things. And they said, we want you to abstain in verse number 29 from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. This was the apostles writing to new converts and they said, don't drink blood, don't eat anything offered to an idol, and don't commit fornication. Now, it's ridiculous to say that he was uh, speaking only to the single people in his audience. Of course, there were married people who were new converts there um, in, in that uh, letter that, or that direction that that scripture was aimed. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 20. I'll read it to you. Now, we're going to go a little slow now, and it's very important that we establish a base for this, and it's going to take a little bit, so you listen carefully and hear me patiently. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, 
because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit what? Fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. We're talking about a sin here, and that sin is fornication. Verse 21 said, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And watch him change that fornication to adultery in verse 22. The Holy Ghost said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Fornication and adultery are interchangeable in Revelation chapter 2. Now, if you don't believe that, then you're saying that he, complained, he changed the complete subject from one verse to the next and referred to something that it wasn't even talking about two verses before that. That's Revelation 2, 20, 21, 22. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man in the church who was committing sin. The sin is called fornication. And the woman that was involved in the sin is married. Verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. There is a married woman committing a sin with a man in this church and the sin is called fornication. The definition that fornication involves only single people has absolutely no support at all. God called Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 8, the Lord made a covenant of marriage with Jerusalem. In verse 15, 26 through 29, the Lord said they committed fornication. Sometimes he said fornication, sometimes he said adultery. They're used interchangeable. In Ezekiel chapter 23 and verse 3, there were two virgins. They committed sin, sexual sin with men. And you can read about it in Ezekiel 23. And God called that sin adultery in verses 36 and 37. Virgins committing adultery. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to get your Bible and look at this now. And don't, don't let the devil get in you now and, and start saying, well, he just says this because... It. Listen to what I'm saying now. Listen. See if I'm using Scripture to back up what I say. See if I'm saying what the Scripture said. This has been burning in my heart for a long, long time, friend, for years and years and years. And I think many preachers are scared out of their wits, afraid somebody's going to come out and preach and teach these things because they think, well, boy, if we do that, we'll get in all kinds of trouble and everybody's going to start getting a divorce. Well, that's not true, brother. Uh, truth never hurt anybody. And if somebody takes advantage of the truth, that's their problem. And I've heard people say, well, you shouldn't teach that because if you do, everybody will be getting a divorce. And that is the same excuse that free will Baptists use against Baptists for teaching eternal security. They say, well, you shouldn't teach that because people will go out and live like the devil. What difference does it make, brother? Our job is to teach the Bible and preach the book as it is. If someone abuses the grace of God, that's their problem. If someone abuses the Lord's teaching on marriage or on temperance or on, on grace or on anything, they'll answer to him for it. Our job is to teach the truth, and the truth will stand when the world's on fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. Here we go. Neither let us commit fornication. Neither let us, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 8. You reckon he is just talking to single people? You reckon that 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is written to no one that's married? I don't know anybody that believes that. Show me, ask your preacher when you discuss these things, if everyone in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Ten was single and never been married. Look at it. Neither let us commit fornication. Why didn't he say you single people? Because fornication and adultery are synonymous. They're interchangeable. One can mean the other in the word of God. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. 
referring to the Old Testament plague there in Numbers chapter 25, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now he's talking about a plague that back in the Old Testament in, chap in Numbers 25, where in one day twenty three thousand people died. And the reason twenty three thousand people died was because they committed fornication. Now, would any honest Christian who's sincere and believes the Bible honestly look you right in the eye and tell you they know that nobody died in that plague who was married? Did anybody in the plague die? According to, according to the modern day teaching of some preachers that they picked it up from each other on radio broadcasts and at camp meetings, Nobody can commit fornication but single people. And you mean to tell me that all 23,000 of those people that died in that plague were all single and nobody who was married died? That's ridiculous. Fornication in the Bible does mean adultery. Now let's go to Jude chapter 1. Of course, Jude only has one chapter. And verse number 7. The first and only chapter there of the book of Jude. And look at verse number 7. The sin here also is called fornication, and it's committed by the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah in Jude, the only in first chapter, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to what? Fornication. That's homosexuality. And going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. All right, what I've done so far is give you Bible proof, and that ought to be enough for any man that fears God and trembles at his word, that fornication in the word of God means sin not only before marriage, but sexual sin after marriage, and it doesn't have to be between a man and a woman. It can be uh, incest, uh, bestiality, it can be homosexuality, any kind of sexual sin. And lo and behold, when we go to the Greek and Hebrew definition of the word fornication, it is exactly the same. Some teachers try to claim that fornication only refers to premarital sin. They teach that a, a man can divorce a mate for sexual sin committed before marriage, but not for sexual sin after marriage, as usual. But of course this won't work at all, not from the Bible anyway. What are the facts about fornication? In Hebrew and Greek, the word fornication includes incest, sodomy, harlotry, perversion, and all sexual sin, both before and after marriage. We're not necessarily concerned with the definition of fornication in modern English that, that it's uh, come to mean nowadays among a lot of folks. Our English word comes from the Latin fornix, F-O-R-N-I-X, and it means a brothel. It literally means a vault or a cell where Roman harlots lived. Uh, our leading dictionaries, even in English, recognize the Hebrew and Greek meaning of fornication. Now, you can pick up a little dictionary, a small uh, dictionary that's not, in, not a detailed dictionary, and you'll find in there that fornication, the, the first meaning of it in a small dictionary, is sexual activity between unmarried persons. And boy, if you ain't careful, you'll just pick up the ball and start running with it. But you get a good dictionary, any big dictionary in your library, in your town, and go look it up, and I challenge you to find, uh, to look at what you may find. The Hebrew word for fornication is zana, Z-A-N-A-H. Its meaning is of a married woman to commit adultery. That's... Uh, the Student's Hebrew Lexicon, Davies and Mitchell, page 185, published in 1957. Young's Analytical Concordance says that fornication is a married woman, is a fornicatress. Young's Analytical Concordance, page 452. This is all Hebrew uh, definitions that I'm giving you now. This is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 746, by the Erdman Publishing Company, 1952. Quote, fornication, Hebrew zena, to commit 
adultery. Every form of unchastity is included in the term fornication. All right? Here's, let's give it some, um, all the leading sources uh, agree with this Hebrew definition. Let's talk about Greek for just a moment. The Greek word for fornication is pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. Now that rings a bell, don't it? That's where we get our word pornography. In pornography, it includes all sexual sin. It signifies, I'm going to give you some quotes now. These are not just my teachings. Or I'm not trying to cover for anybody or no. anything like that. These are uh, documented definitions of the word fornication. Expository Dictionary of New Testament Word by Vine, Volume 2, page 125, published in 1948. Quote, it stands for or includes adultery. All right? This is from, it includes demos philo of every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitution, unchastity. Adultery appears as fornication of the sexual unfaithfulness of a married woman. That's from a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, page 699, University of Chicago Press. All right? This is from the New Testament for English Readers by Alfred Dean, page 33, published by Moody Press. Quote, Fornication must be taken to mean sin, not only before marriage, but also after it also in a wider sense as including adultery likewise. All right? This is from Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, page 532, quote, Pornea, that's fornication, illicit sexual intercourse in general. All other interpretations of the term are to be rejected. Amen and amen. All right? In the Expositor's Greek New Testament, on the meaning of fornication, it says this, The term pornea is to be taken in its proper sense and not to be restricted to any one particular form. Here it goes again. Vincent's Word Studies in the New Testament applies fornication to married men, volume 4, pages 35 and 36. Greek scholars refer to the vocabulary of the New Testament as the final court of appeals because it shows the, the inscriptions of how Bible words were used in the time of Bible writers. On the meaning of fornication, they say this. This is published by the Erdman's Publishing Company in 1959, page 529, quote, applied to unlawful sexual intercourse generally. Jews back in the Israel were, were put to death for acts of fornication, both before and after marriage. The death penalty sometime later was, uh, well, or even at the beginning there, was for incest, sodomy, bestiality, and all kind, any kind of forbidden sexual acts. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he gave his statement here on divorce, didn't give the least indication that he was trying to change the Old Testament meaning of this word. The meaning of premarital sin only was never in the Old Testament or in New Testament times attached to the word fornication. There was a fellow who wrote a book, Dr. Charles, by the name of the teaching of the New Testament on divorce in London in 1921, and he said this, quote, Fornication has the exclusive sense they did not, it did not teach that fornication has the exclusive sense of premarital sin. The history of the word fornication has never, to his knowledge, Dr. Charles, been investigated, nor of its manifold meaning described, definitely recognized, and they began to study it during those days and found out that uh, the scriptures that I gave you just a minute ago in Numbers 25, 1 Corinthians 10, Revelation 2, some of those included all kinds of sexual unfaithfulness. Quote, this is from 
a patristic Greek lexicon from the Oxford University Press, 1961. Now, I realize that most of you folks couldn't care less about what a Greek lexicon says, and I know a lot of young people get a hold of these tapes and stuff, and you just want me to get on with it. But I'm doing this for those uh, who make a lot of dogmatic statements they're not able to prove, and I guess this is just what you call homework, and I'm just giving more and more evidence for the position we take on these tapes. This lexicon says this in volume 4, page 1122, quote, Fornication, illicit intercourse committed by married people, hence including or identified with adultery. Baker's Dictionary of Theology, 1960, page 228, quote, Pornea, fornication, is adultery. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 that fornication was frequent among the Gentiles. And uh, who in the world can say that he was only talking to unmarried people? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 11 not to keep company with fornicators. You reckon it was all right for him to keep company with adulterers? From classical times onward, fornication includes the sin of a married woman. Fornication in the Bible this is from Webster's New 20th Century Dictionary. This is an English dictionary now. Listen, listen. Webster's New 20th Century Dictionary, College Edition, copyright 1962 by the World Publishing Company. Quote, fornication. In the Bible, any unlawful intercourse, including adultery. Now, now did you get that? Quote, Webster's Third New International Dictionary, copyright 1961, by Merriam Company, publishers of the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, quote, fornication is sometimes, especially in the Bible, used to include all sexual intercourse except between husband and wife. And now, without just boring you with more and more and more of these quotes, let me give you some more dictionaries that have this same definition to the word fornication. You ready? Britannica, World Dictionary. Funk and Wagnall's New Standard Dictionary. The New Century Dictionary. A New English Dictionary. American College Standard Reference Dictionary. A New English Dictionary on Historical Principles from the Oxford Press. Twenty volumes of that one. How about this? Westminster Dictionary of the Bible. These are a few Bible dictionaries. Theological Word Book of the Bible. Quito's Cyclopedia of Biblical Literature. Harper's Bible Dictionary. Fawcett's Encyclopedia and Dictionary. Unger's Bible Dictionary. Hastings Dictionary of the Bible. The leading Greek works and commentaries are in agreement with these the sense of fornication that I, that I have given you here in the last few minutes. So why in the world and with what proof in the world could a man say he knows that fornication only means sin between unmarried people? I'd like to see a big, full dictionary that says that fornication is only sex between premarital sin. And if you showed me 50 dictionaries that said that, they would be wrong because the Bible doesn't teach it. All I did, the reason I gave you these dictionaries is to go show that these dictionaries do support what the Word of God teaches about fornication and not what uh, some people try to claim they do. Now, our view that we've taken on these studies of fornication is backed up by evidence from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from the Hebrew lexicons, from the Greek lexicons, the Jewish writings, Christian literature, classical Greek, the rabbi's literature, the Eastern and Western church fathers, and all other authoritative sources. The premarital view of fornication has no authoritative support. And so when we come to the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, uh, and Jesus said, except it be for fornication, there's one thing for sure, absolute positive. He was not referring only to a sin committed by a Jewish virgin while she was engaged because a married person could not commit adultery. If a person takes that view, 
And I know there's a lot of good men that take that view. There's some godly preachers that take that view. There's some preachers that love the Lord that take... There's some preachers that I'm sure could uh, can preach the house down, and I love them, and I'm praying for them, and I have nothing against them, and I hope God uses them and blesses their ministry and continues. But if a man takes that view, if a man takes the view that the Scripture in Matthew 19 is dealing with a Jewish bride committing fornication only before marriage or else that a man came to his bride on their wedding night and found out she wasn't a virgin and that's the only interpretation for Matthew chapter 19. If a man takes that view, I want to give you three things you better watch out real careful for. Number one, He's reading something isn't to the text that isn't there. And I'd be careful about accepting a view that a man has that is not in the Scripture. And I know a lot of preachers that love God believe that. And I'll tell you the reason they believe it. Instead of doing their homework and studying the thing out, they've gone off somewhere and heard some preacher preach that God has used, and they think, well, surely because this great man believes it, it must be right. But, of course, great men are not. I heard somebody say one time, or heard of someone said one time, they said, now, you better not go against that teaching of them godly men that's taught you all these years. Well, let me ask you something, brother. What's the final authority, godly men or the Word of God? Now, you answer me. I, I appreciate godly men. I appreciate preachers. I love preachers. Preachers are my favorite people in the world. And I, I think...